Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new episode of Stories from Space Podcast, where your host, Matthew Williams, examines the history of human spaceflight, the breakthroughs that revolutionized our understanding of the universe and our place in it, and the brave individuals who work tirelessly to advance the frontiers of our understanding. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. The authors acknowledge that this podcast was recorded on the traditional unceded lands of the Lekwungen peoples. Welcome back to Stories from Space. I'm your host, Matt Williams, and joining me today, I need to get your, let me pull up your bio stuff here, um, because I want to uh, be able to specifically say exactly who you are and, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I should have had this... Uh, Correct. That's okay. I've been, I've been getting very informal lately and letting, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And letting my guests introduce themselves, but I, I, I listening back to it, I, uh, I felt it was, uh, I didn't really, it wasn't really doing them any favors, you know, <laughs> it's like they can introduce themselves. They don't need me. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Joining me in the book today is Professor Alex Ellery from Carleton University, which just happens to be my alma mater as well. Go Ravens. Now, Professor, you are, uh, your specialty is mechanical and aerospace engineering. And recently, uh, we caught up to discuss uh, your recent papers on von Neumann probes and how we could prevent these things from essentially running amok. So this goes to the heart of uh, a, a lot of things, not the least of which um, von Neumann probes themselves, universal assemblers, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, humanity's future in space. Um, so what I'd love uh, is right now, could you, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what von Neumann probes, what universal assemblers are? Sure. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, a self-replicating machine <clears throat> is a machine that can build a copy of itself, <clears throat> clone itself, essentially. Uh, one of the uh, one of the ideas explored by John von Neumann was that uh, you know to try and build a self-replicating machine, uh, it had to have it had to be a, a, what is called a, a universal constructor. So the idea is that essentially a universal constructor is a machine that can build anything, provided it's given the appropriate resources. Uh, energy and information, i.e. instructions, uh, to build anything, uh, including a copy of itself. So uh, if you can build yourself, uh, by definition, it's a, a universal constructor is a self-replicating machine. So that's what it is in a nutshell. Now, the advantage, of course, is of having universal structures, you can reprogram, a, reprogram the self-replicating machine to build something else. So this provides it its use, utility, its usefulness. A self-replicating machine by itself doesn't really do anything useful. All, all it does is, is expand its population. Uh, its utility is in also what it can build once it's build it, built up its productive capacity. So this idea, right? I mean, it has, it has been built upon by several generations of theorists because... I don't recall von Neumann when he when he spoke about universal assemblers or constructors, the idea that they would make themselves, say, progressively smaller, and that's that's something Richard Feynman came up with there, right? He in his uh, there's plenty of room at the bottom, the idea that self-replicating machines could make themselves smaller and smaller and, and give you access to matter right down to the smallest levels, and Eric Drexler did the same with nanotechnology and was it molecular assemblers? I think he called it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So this 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 sort of pushed into the realm of like nanotechnology and 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 so forth. So yeah, what is what is the major concern with machines like this? 
Sure. I think, yes, you're right. Von Neumann wasn't really talking about nanotechnology as such. He was talking about the general idea of self-replication as it applied to biological systems as well as potential artificial systems. Uh, he was also interested in exploring how evolution might work in, in such machines as well. Now, Feynman and then Drexler essentially expanded on, on Feynman's, uh, I think it was an afternoon speech, I think, the way he made it was a talk called uh, There's Room at the Bottom or something. And Drexler wrote his thesis and, and his book, or two books actually, on this concept of nanotechnology. And he actually explored this idea of building self replicating machines essentially to emulate how biology works on a cellular level. So he was thinking on lines of how we could build these molecular assemblers to build atom by atom, essentially replicating essentially what, at least functionally, what DNA does at, at a molecular level. The problem then became, well, what happens if the whole this self-replication process, particularly involving nanotechnology, goes awry and, and runs amok, essentially? And he came up with the, the concept of, of the grey goo scenario, where the self-replicating machines replicate out of all control and they just basically they just convert all biological matter, all physical matter into just copies of themselves, uh, which he referred to as grey goo. Of course, this is quite a frightening concept. It's a kind of doomsday con- concept. And it has, had a, has quite a strong purchase in the public domain. Personally, I think the dangers of that happening are, are overinflated. And, but being aware of public perception uh, of fears was one of the reasons I wrote the paper on the paper I did on um, trying to curb the self-replication process. Yeah, it does. Yes, in fact, Drexler's own discussion about this and how it you know relates to biology. You took a very very similar approach there, right? A synthetic biology to imitate the real thing. Um, now, a quick, uh, just a quick illustration here for our, our listeners. So, the gray goo problem. You've definitely. You've most likely seen this somewhere, as Dr. Ellery said, this is, uh, as an idea, it's made the rounds. And there are many examples in science fiction, but yes, the idea being that this swarms of nanomachines and they look like a, a silver puddle because, you know, all these, just these machines together, they, they would look like a puddle of liquid from a, for, to the naked eye. And yeah, they're basically spreading over everything and consuming everything in their wake because oh. they're just, that's what they're programmed to do. I think there's a very good uh, rendition of this in the remake of uh, the, the Day the Earth Stood Still. If you've seen the remake, uh, that was, I think, self-replicating nano machines um, just eating up everything. There, there's also a really good one on Futurama. There's an episode where the, the robot among them, Bender, he decides through sheer laziness that he's going to use a, a duplicator that uh, another person invented to make two smaller versions of himself, basically to do his chores. And then, yeah, they too, out of laziness, decide to replicate themselves and onward ad infinitum. And it becomes a doomsday scenario because one thing they found was that they consume alcohol to get their chemical energy. So they ended up drinking all the alcohol in the world and but then yeah in order to survive they start converting all the water into alcohol and uh, oh yeah the effects on our, on earth is are terrible so your papers to get to what you recommended there and after that i want to talk about extraterrestrials because mm. <laughs> we we couldn't possibly get into this without me bringing that up but yeah um in your papers you talked about how we could humanity could create von neumann probes with synthetic biology right that would ensure that they can't run amok it wasn't quite synthetic biology uh, what, what i was looking at i was looking at various biological phenomena which curtail the self-replication process in nature and then trying to emulate that in a machine so it wasn't quite synthetic biology uh, it was biomimetic essentially so it was kind of like a, it was trying to copy the biological approach but in an engineering capacity, as opposed to synthetic biology, which is kind of like uh, synthetic biology sits in the middle between biology and engineering. Uh, I, what I was doing is I was overstepping that, uh, that synthetic biology by directly incorporating some of the functions and ideas from biology into the machine. 
I was particularly I was I was particularly focused on looking at telomeres, the concept of telomeres. And these <clears throat> telomeres, these are what control cell death, right? In uh, in 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 actual biology. I was going to say human, but this applies to uh, most species of animals uh, on Earth. Yeah. So, can tell us uh, how do telomeres operate first, and how do we how do we biomimetically reproduce that? Right. Well, you can imagine a telomere is that it's, they're basically you could always call them like junk DNA. They 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 basically cap the ends of DNA with various non-coding sequences. And what happens is when the DNA replicates itself, it uses various types of molecules. When the molecules clamp onto the DNA and they start reading, uh, they open it up and, and, and it starts replicating, they miss out the first segments of the DNA. Uh, so what happens is that when you, when you get a copy, it, it basically the telomeres are being shortened at every replication cycle. So it acts like a counter. And in biological systems, there you know, varies from cell to cell, cell type. There are around about 15 or 20 uh, uh, so like replication cycles that impose a limit uh, in biological systems. So the idea is to take that notion of a counter and put it, port that into a machine. You could theoretically have a software counter to basically measure how many times you replicate, but that is potentially corruptible. So the safest way to do it is to do it as they do in biology, is to actually have a physical counter, which I've likened to a kind of like a, if you look at the encoding of the self-replicating machine, you have a tail of non-coding cells. And basically when you start copying, your copier sits at the foot of that tail, sorry, at the end of that tail, but doesn't copy the, the first set of cells that it's sitting on and only copies subsequently. So what this means is that essentially every generation, you'll get a shorter and shorter tail uh, and that essentially imposes a limit. So once that tail is gone and you try to replicate beyond that, it'll start the it'll sort of start corrupting the actual uh, coding of, the, of your self-replicator. So that's basically how, how the idea behind yeah. it. Right. Yeah. So in a nutshell, as the robots uh, reproduce every, every new produced model, they're counting down to machine death or just a stop command, right? So they can only produce so many. Yeah. It's, it's more than a stop command because it's actually physical. Uh, so basically it can't, once it's once the tail is gone and it tries to replicate, uh, copy all the information in your core memory, because it'll start corrupting. It'll start getting corrupted because it won't be copying all that all that information, uh, and so the, the self replication won't be able to function in a subsequent generation. So, in terms of uh, applications, you spelled you you illustrated what uh, these would be in your latest paper. Now, the companion paper, I'm not sure if you, you also mentioned applications there as well, but yeah, they are most immediately for the moon and for Mars beyond. Human space exploration would benefit immensely from these, right? So, yeah. What's that look yeah, like? Um, uh, yes, actually, uh, strangely enough, I, when I first got interested in this, I was at this whole concept of uh, self-replicating machines. It was actually because I was interested in the SETI question. <clears throat> And I came across the sagan tipler debate, uh, which hinged on this idea of self-replicating machines, essentially colonizing the galaxy. And that's what my, my the, one of the papers was about, was about this concept. I've, since that more recently, so like over the past eight years or so, I've been looking at how to build a self-replicator on the moon using lunar resources. Uh, so the two are related, they, they, they have a connection that, if you can build a self-replicator to utilize lunar resources, then essentially you can build a self-replicator to utilize asteroidal resources and other resources in the solar system. So essentially what the self-replicator does, it provides you with a mechanism to completely colonize your entire solar system 
from that, you also have the ability to, to send out probes to into interstellar space using in techniques of interstellar flight, solar cells or uh, laser propelled cells or, or whatever. And then that sets off, off, off a whole chain of uh, capabilities to actually uh, essentially colonize the entire galaxy over a relatively short space of time, uh, astronomically speaking, you know, million years or so. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that, uh, <clears throat> yes, that is a, a very, very exciting idea. We could send probes out ahead of us, assuming humanity ever wanted to do interstellar travel, right? We could send probes out mm -hmm. ahead of us to what we know to be, or actually they wouldn't even have to be habitable on their own. They could be terraformed by these probes in advance. And by the time human colonists show up hundreds or thousands of years later, you have an entire settlements and world built up. Sure. Or you could build O'Neill colonies or whatever. Yes. Basically, you can adapt uh, your solution to the particular environment, and with, uh, the particular stellar system or extrasolar system that you find yourself in, that the probe finds itself in. So it could have multiple you could have multiple missions for different types of scenarios. Um, the advantage of, of doing it, doing this using self-replicating machines, of course, is its exponential growth capacity. You know, you, for the cost of only one or two of these machines, you send out to the nearest star systems, and that's that's the only capital investment you need to put into it. The rest all happens utilizing the resource, local resources uh, in those uh, target. Uh, uh, extra solar systems yeah absolutely yeah and in the meantime yeah we could we could use this to effectively settle where wherever anywhere really in the solar system and indeed the, uh, yeah the job of the heavy lifting and constructing would be handled by automated probes before humans ever get there yes now yes and you touched on the the implications or, or, or how this idea has been brought up in terms of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, yes, thank you for doing that because that's <laughs> it provides us with the perfect segue. Now, I, I have been looking and looking, trying to figure out when exactly von Neumann probes became a part of the SETI debate. And I can't really find any one moment, but it, it is clear at, at a certain point and this, this goes to everything really in, in SETI, right? It's like, if we can think of it, then chances are somebody's already done it. So if we're thinking about doing this now, we should be looking for it out there because again, it's right. If it's, if it makes, uh, if, if it works out from a physics perspective, then yeah, there's really no reason to suspect that someone wouldn't have already tried it. And this, this is what Michael Hart and Frank Tipler that they brought up right in their in their papers which basically in which they argued 1975 to the early 80s that they're that humanity is alone in the universe right yes yeah and i, th I think this it's strange that uh, that uh, and, and of course on the other side you had uh rebuttals from people like carl sagan uh, who who basically tried to rebut some of those arguments by hart and tipler I don't think anyone has really succeeded in rebutting those arguments, to be perfectly honest. When I first came across these papers, when I was a student, I was converted immediately from a believer into a, into a skeptic because I felt that Hart and Tipler really found a pretty much a cast iron argument against the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence on the basis that we should see evidence of them. And I think, I, think, uh, I still hold to, hold to that view that we should, have, we should see or have seen uh, clear evidence of um, extraterrestrial intelligence by now, uh, if they exist. One of the, like, uh, the corollaries of this is that uh, we are indeed alone and we have the first mover advantage to basically settle on uh, our, our, not just our local interstellar uh, environment, but also the entire galaxy. So, bottom line, me the uh, super advanced aliens are not coming to kill us all. I, I don't think so. I, I, there's, yeah. there's certainly no evidence of them, uh, yeah. and we would expect to see some evidence. Mm -hmm. um, that's, not, that's that's not to say that they haven't. I mean, there are some constraints. I mean, for example, if a civilization has not an extraterrestrial civilization has not yet become galactic. 
then potentially in its physical footprint is small, then potentially it could exist. But I think I, if you crunch the numbers, if you look at uh, it's like how quickly civilization can be, can convert itself from uh, a step a solar civilization or a stellar civilization into a galactic one, uh, I think it's relative, we should see evidence of that, but we don't see. Yeah. Anything. Well, one of the things I was suggesting was we should probably t- take a closer look at our, our own asteroid belt to see if there's ever any evidence of processing. Yes. Well, you know, um, the Galileo project would definitely support you on that. And uh, them and others, the Kuiper belt was, has also been recommended as a, because as it was said to me, if, if I were going to send probes out to explore there and, you know, pick up resources so that they could self-replicate, yeah, I'd get into the Oort clouds and Kuiper belts of stars. I wouldn't go into the inner solar system where somebody's likely to spot me, right? Or to spot my probes. Because, of course, we don't want exactly want them to freak out. <laughs> then I would argue, well, what are you doing out in the, out in the, into the, in the Kuiper belt? Uh, you know, all the interesting stuff is happening in the inner part of the solar system. And also there's a, there's a lot of free energy there from, from the star or the sun. So, yes, it's possible. Uh, I, I guess, I mean, I can't imagine what technology might be available even 50 years in the future, let alone hundreds or thousands. Um, but my instinct tells me that, that uh, it would be very difficult to pass up a free energy source like the sun. My immediate answer to what am I doing out there would be spying, definitely. But uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, and waiting to make contact. Yeah, I, I do tend to, uh, myself here, I do tend to side with Sagan on this about, but mainly it myself, I, I found the, uh, the arguments uh, interesting when you consider the fact that it's like, um, according to legend, when Fermi asked the question, where is everybody? And we actually covered this subject there in, in the very first episode of this podcast. Mm-hmm. When Fermi asked the question, legend has it that his colleagues who he was discussing this with, they started doing some sort of rough calculations and talking about, well, how long would it take a species to get throughout, to get around the galaxy? How long w- could we expect uh, before we saw some? And their results indicated that, well, theoretically, it should have happened already a, a couple times anyway. Yeah, 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 and I, th- I think one of the one of the um, weaknesses of Sagan's argument is that it requires, you know, a lot of the a lot of the arguments he suggested that any intelligent species would not build self-replicating machines because they're too dangerous. Um, I don't, I don't think that that flies because the sheer utility of such a capability is so attractive. Um, you, if you had the ability to build these things, you would, because they solve so many problems. You could do things like not just mega projects or giga projects, but petter projects. You know, so essentially enormous projects of engineering, which you can't, we can't even contemplate now. Uh, but the self-replicating machine provides you with the, ind- the industrial capacity and the productive capacity to build it, that, to, to grow that capacity exponentially to achieve enormous projects that that uh, would then become achievable. Yeah, this is what I, I really like about the Fermi paradox and SETI and uh, any of these concepts. It's the idea that if we can conceive of it and if, if we, we can honestly say this will be possible for us someday, then yes, somebody else must have attempted this and that gives us something to look for. And that's- Indeed, and, and it only takes one. Yes, exactly. It takes one well, intelligence to do it. And that's... Yes. Well, yeah, that's exactly right, too. And I've said this many times and in the hopes that it might catch on. It's that the to resolve the Fermi paradox, you only need one. One, yes. one probe, one indication of complex biology. It doesn't matter if the civilization, the remains. It doesn't matter if they are long extinct or still around. It's like yeah. right there, boom, you now know, okay, we're not alone in the universe. Let's keep mm-hmm. looking. And yeah, that all it takes is that one thing. And so in terms of humanity's future, looking to the moon, to Mars and beyond, what do you envision like mission architectures that they should look like? 
Assuming right. they have these machines at their disposal, assuming they're programmed to not uh, endlessly self-replicate. Can you give us a sort of... Yeah, I know the scenario that I'm interested in trying to achieve, and that's uh, essentially, I think uh, uh, currently uh, our planet is in a bit of a pickle at the moment because of what we've done to our environment. And one of the problems is that we've got uh, climate change happening and it's going to get worse, a lot worse. And we have no we have no real idea of how to combat it and how, how to uh, roll out uh, clean energy around the world. But there is a solution, and that's the solar power satellite. Now, solar power, fleets of solar power satellites could potentially provide us with global clean energy. The problem has always been, how do we launch it into space from a to be too prohibitively costly, also be environmentally damaging? So... The obvious solution is to try and build it on the moon. And this is one of the things I'm interested in doing, developing a self-replicating machine concept that we can put on the moon at very low cost. And then that builds the capacity, grows itself essentially into a population of machines. Then it basically builds the required capacity of solar power satellites and puts them around the Earth. Obviously, this is, um, I wouldn't say it's a futuristic idea because we're working on it, we're working on bits of it, and I think it can be done. I think given some appropriate resources, I think we could do it within about 15 years. Um, actually have the first self-replicator put onto the surface of the moon, and thence, just only a few years later, uh, it, we could have the full capacity to build the uh, solar power satellites. To me, that's the first step, because what it does, it, it basically it requires us two, two things. It requires us to admit that we have already exceeded the capacity of our Earth to support us. So we need to supply energy, give nature a bit of a helping hand to deliver energy from space to Earth. And it also means that we have to develop the extraterrestrial environment in an industrial manner. And once we've built those solar power satellites, we then have this enormous industrial capacity on the moon that we could use then to explore the rest of the solar system. We could also send self-replicating machines to, to Mars, we would send them to the asteroid belts. We could send them everywhere, wherever we wish to go, build up industrial capacity to build bases, to build whatever we could. And we could do this very, very quickly. I calculated that the generation time for the self-replicating machines that I'm trying to develop is about six months. So, you know, if you crunch the numbers in terms of the population explosion of these machines that you could get, you could basically get through, you could, you could be exploring the solar system, settle the entire solar system within probably a, less than 100 years. And that's the entire solar system, that's Mars, and moons of Jupiter or whatever. So it could potentially be very quick. And it would be very low cost because the amount of uh, capital investment we would need to provide is very small. It basically, just one self-replicating machine to the moon could spawn it all. Well, yeah, and space-based solar, that is a very, very rich and wonderful topic. Um, I, Yeah, in fact, uh, other guests of mine, including the Space Elevator Consortium, that for them, the number one reason to build a space elevator. We could put right. space-based solar arrays in orbit without all the, the rocket launches and, yeah, 24-7 energy harvested from the sun and yeah. no no more need to burn coal or uh, or oil it's no yeah. and, it, and it would be gl available globally uh yes. so um it, it, there'd be no sort of geographical restrictions uh, at all you'd be able to tap in in the energy in any kind of place any remote place that you, you know you, wherever so mm -hmm. uh, it does provide us with a kind of like a, a true egalitarian approach to uh, energy supply uh, mm -hmm. for the world yeah, no more geopolitical conflicts in uh, oil rich areas. No, yeah. indeed, yes. There are no, no, none of the slight haves and have nots and, you know, it's like um, curses of oil curses and so on and so forth. So it would have none, none of that. Now, so in terms of uh, your work and looking ahead, you, you've already started working on bits and pieces for this von Neumann probe. You've been working on the architecture of one, have you not? Not just the architecture, but uh, the various pieces. So, if you going back to, if you go back to sort of like the von Neumann idea, 
you said that self-replicator had four parts. Uh, now, there are two parts that we need to... Two parts of that were essentially a computer. It's basically a, a physical computer and the program itself. And then the other two parts, one was the copier, uh, the program copier. But the key I've been working on is the, the constructing arm. And this, but basically, it's the, the, the robot part, essentially. And if you look at what a robot is, or any kind of machine, any kind of manufacturing machine, it's basically a, a configuration of electric motors with a control mm -hmm. system. So what I started focusing on was what are the basic parts that we need to, to build in order to make this possible to build this, you know, to at least get like uh, the robot part of it sorted out. Mm -hmm. uh, and this basically meant motors. And in fact, we've actually 3D printed an electric motor, an entire electric motor. So we've demonstrated, there are several pieces to this. We've demonstrated that in theory, the 3D printing concept can, 3, you can 3D print an electric motor. And this was inspired by the RepRap 3D printer that was knocking around a few years ago. I have one in my lab, which was a hobbyist 3D printer, which could print some of its own parts out of plastic. So this was kind of like a development of that idea. Another thing we've been looking at is on the electronic side, the computer side, I was looking at uh, trying to implement solid state on the moon. It doesn't look that feasible. So you're trying to develop solid, solid state uh, electronics on the moon. So I started looking at vacuum tubes and most of the materials that you need to build a vacuum tube can be built from lunar material uh, and supplemented by asteroidal material. So that potentially can be a route to electronics. We haven't actually 3D printed that yet, but that's something for the future because that's going to be quite the challenge, that one. But so we've been looking at how, if you try to build a computer, a CPU from vacuum tubes, it'd be the size of a block of flats. So it's too big. So I've been looking at different architectures. So we build neural net circuits, analog neural net circuits instead of a CPU-based architecture. And we've actually built these and, and implemented them on little robots. Uh, we've demonstrated that we can build neural network circuits, actual in the circuitry. And we've also demonstrated we can actually do learning as well in the circuitry. So that's been a, like a major step forward. There are a couple of little, so like a, I wouldn't say minor issues to resolve. Some of them are quite major, but certainly we can see the light at the end of the tunnel that we can actually build learning neural net circuitry physically, which should be a much more compact solution to implementing programs than a CPU uh, and software. Okay. Well, that about brings us to the end of our episode because this is a, an area so rich in detail and offshoots. You know, this discussion can go into so many other areas there because there's so I much. And I didn't even talk about energy generation. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> Well, that too, that too is another very uh, important aspect of this. So for my listeners, is there somewhere they can go to check out your research on this? Any recommended sites there? That's actually a burning issue. I intend to actually develop a website very, very soon where this all the papers and stuff will be available and people can download what they want. And there should be some films, you know, showing some of the things that we've been doing and all of the information that you need. That's a work in progress. I am hoping to have that done over the next few months. Okay. And also what I will do is uh, I'll post links to your papers that I've been citing. Yeah. And uh, a lot of what you said too, SETI and humanity's future in space and looking for aliens based on the kinds of technology we can envision, techno signatures, that's... Uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. something that's going to come up a lot in further episodes. In fact, yeah, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and yeah, I've lined up as many experts as I can to talk about this. And hopefully uh, I can get as many on as uh, possible. And well, you you were, of course, uh, the guy to whom I uh, wanted to, to familiarize my listeners with the idea of von Neumann probes and the progress that's being made towards actually building them. Yes, indeed. Yes. And that... That's the newish part. That's the newest aspect is that, you know, we're, I'm trying to, we're trying to build them uh, as opposed to looking at them in theory and, and so on. So, yes. Yeah, this is an exciting time. So many ideas that were once just 
very popular ideas on paper are actually getting to the point mm. when they can be realized. Which again, the uh, my my guests uh, from the Space Elevator Consortium, and that's that's what they were on about uh, about how we're we're within reach of these of that, and, mm. and that's not yeah. These two things are not base elevators and von Neumann probes. They're not the only things we're, we're on the cusp of. So yes, thank you, Dr. Ellery, so much for coming on, and I want to say good luck in your in your research, and in, you know I wish you uh, great progress ahead, and I'm I'm very happy someone from at Carleton University is working towards this. It tickles me to know my alma mater's uh, contributing. Thank you very much. It's been a blast. It's uh, it's been fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. No problem. I'm Matt Williams. This has been Stories from Space. Tune in again soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stories from Space podcast with Matthew Williams. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSPmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.